All right, what's going on, people of the internet? Welcome back to another episode of the Waveform Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Marquez. And I'm Andrew. And today, we've got a fun one, a couple of uh, different stories, a sort of assortment, if Yeah, you will. a very It's a fun time for that. Broad assortment. It's earlier in the year. Sometimes we get mm-hmm. like heavy weeks, sometimes we get light weeks. This is one of those fun, lighter weeks. So Andrew's going to dive into the Reddit r slash place update for 2022 yeah. and how it went down. We actually had a lot of fun with this it in the Discord. It was so much fun, yeah. Uh, and also, we're going to talk a little bit about, well, I finally did it, and I swapped out the Mac Pro mm-hmm. with, remember last time I said I had that Mac Studio on order? Yep. It's the new editing machine. The last video was edited on the Mac Studio. But we also have a weird trade-in story and what's happening with the Mac yeah, Pros yeah. here now. So we'll talk about that. And we're going to finish up with David interviewing Jad from Radiolab and what he's up to after his historic podcasting career. A little bit of an OG. You know, podcasts... The OG, podcasts, probably. Podcasts yeah. have a long history. Yeah. We're not exactly uh, <laughs> veterans to this space, no, despite having a couple. All, yeah. So that'll be a fun one, too. But first, Twitter adding an edit button. Loyal soldiers of the Twitter edit war. This is crazy. We have won. This is crazy. We have declared victory. How long have I been asking? I, I want to find the first time I ever mentioned oh, the Twitter that's... button because this has been a meme, basically. I feel like since at least college, I've been asking Twitter for an edit button. Dear Twitter, let us edit tweets. It is 2017, and we have a giant machine digging a tunnel under Los Angeles to build an actual hyperloop, but we still can't edit tweets. We have the Large Hadron Collider. We found the God Particle. We still can't edit tweet. And every time I bring it up, inevitably, of course, I hear about the pros and the cons. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, Twitter might not be the biggest social network ever, but it does have quite the user base. It's sort of like a public sphere, if you will. Uh-huh. A lot of important people use it. And there's a lot of implications for what editing tweets might mean. And the bigger Twitter's gotten, the more vocal those downsides have been. But I maintain editing tweets would not like be the downfall of Twitter. It would not ruin Twitter. Mm-hmm. I think it would be great. But I do want to address all of the conversation around the edit button. First, it was announced, well, the announcement was kind of weird itself actually. Yeah, yeah. The the whole thing was interesting. And what's funny about it is because of how much of a meme you've turned this into and how you talk about it all the time, it almost Years. felt like you were part of it. If, if you only if you look, look back at my Twitter timeline, it kind of looks like I was in on it. Yeah. I promise I was not in on this one. No. Um, I tweeted on April Fool's Day before the announcement mm-hmm. from Twitter, tech company accidentally unveils product people actually want on April Fool's Day, which, which is kind of a thing that happens all the time. And it's not just Twitter. It happens a lot. But it works perfectly because... Very shortly after that, Twitter did their April Fool's joke. A couple hours later. In quotes, saying they were adding an edit button. We're working on an edit button. Straight up tweeted it. Tweeted it. And everyone went, thanks a lot, Twitter. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we all know lots of people want it, but an April Fool's Day tweet, very funny. And then I I think like a day ago or something like that, I tweeted tweeted something with a typo in it, but it was like 20 minutes later and it was like too late to take back all the conversations I'd had about the tweet, so I just Mm -hmm. left it. And then I tweeted, you think I make typos on purpose to like continue to argue for the edit button, but I don't. I really don't. I just mm-hmm. keep making typos. Which brings up the number one thing I always hear, which is, Marquez, just proofread your tweet. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. That's, I I try. Yeah. If you're not, if you're a human, you make mistakes sometimes yeah. and you make typos. So it's not like I'm out here saying if everyone should be perfect. If you've ever written a paper for school or something, like you've most likely proofread it and just because you've written it and you know what is being said on the paper, it's very easy to skip small exactly. typos, especially when like a, a word checker or spell checker is not picking it up because if you're spelling what something that is a real word, a real but word. it's not the word you wanted, exactly. it won't show up. So it could just be wrong. Everybody's done it. If you pretend you didn't, you're lying. You've made just a typo. Yeah. Stop it. A real um, life typo. Yeah. yeah. And even, so that that's my main argument, by the way, for Twitter uh, having an edit button. Just to finish the timeline, a couple days later, I guess this was yesterday for us as we mm-hmm. record this, but on Tuesday this week, Twitter announces, no, seriously, we're actually working on an edit button. Yeah. And this is funny because this is like, what, a day after Elon Musk announced he bought 9% of Twitter <laughs> and then asked if they wanted an edit button on Twitter yeah, and did so a take poll. One step back here, <laughs> Elon purchased a large number of shares for Twitter. I believe it's about 9%. He's the largest shareholder on Twitter. The largest shareholder. Then 
got invited to join the board of Twitter. A lot of people were talking about that, then posted a poll asking if there should be an edit button. Mm -hmm. And everyone started going crazy. And within 24 hours of that is when the Twitter comms uh, handle mm -hmm. tweeted that they're working on it. They all, they said, yes, we've been working on an edit feature since last year. No, we didn't get the idea from a poll. We're mm -hmm. kicking off testing with Twitter Blue Labs in the coming months to learn what works, what doesn't, and what's possible. So yeah. if for some reason you really think that Elon poll is what created this, it's not. It's, it's But the timing is like his announcement probably, f his, his tweet probably forced their hand to just announce it so that people wouldn't think forced their hand or he bought all the shares was talking to people at Twitter and that's also a Figured good way to out. bring hype. Fair yeah. enough. Um, Either way, it's going to be a Twitter Blue Labs feature coming in a few months. Now, I just want to re refresh this again because I've said this before, like yes. I'm for adding a Twitter edit button under a few specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. The number one thing I keep seeing that is an obvious concern is what if I tweet something, I like cheese. A bunch of people like it, retweet it, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then an hour later, I go in and edit it and say something horrific that obviously you'd never want to be attached to. Yeah. Something like 24 FPS is better or something yeah, ridiculous okay, like good, that, right? Good way to go on that. Yeah. I would never want to be associated with anyone saying that, but I already liked this tweet. So now it looks like I like the tweet saying 24 FPS or is better or tweet, retweeted like, it yeah. like an endorsement. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. If you if you add an edit button, that's what it's going to look like. Yeah. My argument would be a couple fold. One, you need to make it very obvious that it was an edited tweet. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's probably more than an asterisk. It's probably some sort of a, some print or something alongside the tweet, a color, something that shows that this is an edited tweet and that you should show the original tweet. Yeah. So you can already edit an Instagram caption, a YouTube description, a Facebook post. All of mm -hmm. these things have already existed. News, everyone's always been able to edit social media posts. Yeah. Other than tweets. Now, these other mediums may often have other media attached to them. Like on Instagram, it's a caption, but also a photo. Mm -hmm. So if I like a photo and someone changes a caption, does that imply that I liked the new caption? No, I liked the photo. But since Twitter is just text, you know, there's a little extra concern. Like yeah. it's just the text we're associating with. And the best way to compare this right now is how Reddit does it, which is also can, purely text. A yep. lot of people commenting and upvoting on it, although pub upvotes aren't displayed publicly, but... It adds an asterisk. I believe it adds a history as well. Yep. They also do it a little differently. I think if you edit within the first 60 seconds, you don't get an asterisk. Okay, but I do think on Twitter, it should potentially still do it anyways, just I like to that. be safe. I like that because I'll just say the other thing you should do is, you know, add a limited amount of characters you can change yeah. and a limited amount of time that you can edit. Yeah. So really what that narrows it down to for me is typos. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, which are going to happen within like five minutes. Someone says, oh, did you mean four, not 40? Oh, mm -hmm. my bad. It's already like the thread has already, this is in the middle of a thread. Like I can't go back and redo the rest of this. I just want to edit this real quick. I jump in there, edit the tweet, make it say 40 instead of four, like I meant to. And then everything's good. You can see that it was edited. You can see what was edited and none of the engagement has to disappear. Yeah. Um, so that's really the main thing. Like if, as long as all of that is super clear, then I think that's a totally reasonable feature to add to Twitter. And that would save me, uh, a lot of the OCD of like having tweets out with typos that yeah, I wanted to leave. Because you have somebody quick enough telling you that something is wrong, but enough to where if you change that, the majority of the conversation is still going to be what the basis of the tweet was about. And yep. that's, and that's what happens. But like sometimes if you don't notice for five minutes or whatever, there are a lot of tweets about that. You've kind of lost that, but you've also lost the traction because it just got wildly popular. You lost all that engagement kind of. Yeah, and yeah. This this is like a, it's a small user problem or a small group of users that have the problem. But when you have enough engagement very quickly, that's usually when people find a typo. So like if you make a typo in a tweet and an hour later there's no engagement, but you found the typo, then yeah, you can delete the tweet mm -hmm. and tweet it again because that doesn't change anything. But if you have a lot of engagement very quickly, usually that's how you find the typo. But then yeah. that's also a lot of engagement very quickly and the conversation starting and the quote tweets and everything. It's funny because Twitter actually just acts, did this weird thing where they changed the way Twitter embeds work. So a bunch of old 
articles that had embedded tweets now just have like blank boxes. Oh, really? And that's like you just removed the conversation from the context of what it's, huh. it's like. It's basically like if I were to delete my tweet, everyone's quote tweet would now make no sense. So the bottom line is yeah. you preserve all the engagement by having that quick edit button for, I don't know, five, ten characters to just fix a quick typo. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense for Twitter Blue. We don't know if this is what's going to be how they finish it because they just said they're going to test on it right now. But like yeah. you said, it's a small user group that would really benefit from this. So paying for it, sounds yeah. it sounds reasonable to yeah. me. People were trying to tell me that the un, the undo tweet button was was good enough. That was terrible. Now, that I don't I don't count that. That was just like making sure that. you proofread, but we just talked about how proofreading doesn't necessarily mean finding things correctly. Yeah, it was um, also broken on Android for months. <laughs> so, not that surprised <laughs> on my phone anyway. Um, so yeah, and we don't know how this is going to work yet. The most we saw was a quick GIF that they posted, where next to your tweet in the menu option, the three dots in the top right corner that you usually get. At the bottom of that is just an edit tweet button on top of everything else. So we don't know what it entails, if there's a character limit, if there's a time limit, what right. the um, potential, if there's a an edit history. So we'll see what yeah. happens. All of those things w- I think they should do, and I think they should be, they're probably considering all that stuff yeah. as they build it. But yeah, you know, people using the beta feature will be the first ones to give them the feedback about that. Yeah. And I think the, the only other thing I can add on this, besides you will be getting it day one, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who think it might get abused despite what we said. I'm sure the first week there will be a lot of really weird Twitter interactions. Kind of you remember when they changed it from 140 to 280 yeah. and everyone's timeline was just like spam. Just just memeing the new feature yeah. to see if they can pull the string all the way and Yeah, you want it. that viral tweet or whatever. Yeah. It'll probably happen for the first week and then yep. I think it'll go back to totally normal. Like yeah. Reddit has this feature and it works really, really well and I rarely see a time where it's being abused by anything. So it yeah. it clearly can work. So I'm I'm ready for that. Twitter yeah, I'm sure if you, you wanna are. just hook me up with that alpha yeah, can we can app. we unbox this on live for you guys? Can I be the first one to edit a tweet? Would that be like full circle? That'd be pretty sick. It's probably happened already. With I think some you're going to need to buy. Some, if you buy ten percent of Twitter stock, <laughs> that's how much it costs Elon, me. You have to beat Elon. Yeah, fine. All right, I'll keep waiting. <laughs> I'm in the beta, but no. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the Mac Pro mm-hmm. retirement situation. The retirement. The Viking funeral. It's kind of a weird. It feels worse. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's uh, so there's no there's no one right answer, but there's a number of things you can do with a computer when you're done using it. All right. Perfect you example. Can, we made planters out of the old yeah. Mac Pro. Well, I don't know why we still have those, but yeah, we <laughs> do. We do still have the old 2013. That's how long it's been. 2013. Yeah. Trash can Mac Pro. Nobody is gonna buy those. We could have sold it for a thousand bucks to someone who might have used it, but I think we had our, our good fun with it. Our, and they're gonna live in the studio. The GPU they're was like here. literally damaged though on the yeah. one you had. It was like showing green pixels as you used it. Yeah, it so. was it was kind of rough. So that we we got our, our use out of those. The Mac Pro, uh, only two years old, 2019, mm. and somebody I think tweeted at me pretty recently a, a snippet from our video where I'm like, and I'm really happy with it, and I'm really looking forward to it lasting me hopefully a decade and getting better over time. Lots changed. Yeah. Landscape's different. Yeah, it's a little, that did not age well. Nope. Um, so I got the the Mac Studio with, I, I maxed it out basically. Yeah. I, I have the 128 gigs of memory. I have the eight terabytes of storage, which is necessary for my workflow. I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not use a four terabyte version. We regularly go over four terabytes of working media on mm-hmm. our projects. And I edit everything on one machine. So I maxed it out and, you know, set it up and started working with it. And I did the first full pass edit on the the latest video, which was about YouTube comments. It actually had a failure in the export. And it was maybe 30% in and it said export failed. And then it showed me exactly the timestamp at which it failed. And I went mm. into the timeline and it was from an old screen recording I was using from the previous Mac. So I just reshot the screen recording Drop that in there, edited, everything went smoothly, all my plugins work, everything's good. And so now I just have this Mac Pro that we spent, I, I spent 40, I looked it up, $42,000 yeah, on that Mac Pro was, yeah. um, that I no longer need. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a couple, there's some things you can do with a computer like that. One, you can try to sell it, and there's a couple ways you can sell it. Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, eBay, 
Two, you can recycle it. Three, you could throw it out, I guess. Mm. Not ideal. And uh, Apple also actually has a trade-in program, which we looked up, and mm -hmm. you can put in the specs and the serial number, and it'll give you a trade-in value. Yeah. Now, I'm guessing most people would not have guessed which one we picked, but we, we originally decided we're probably going to try to sell we it. We threw it out. I'm, <laughs> no, just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just threw it in the trash. No, we, it's, it's a perfectly working machine, but it's also wor slightly worse in almost every way at everything we need it to do. So it doesn't actually have a use. It's like if you have a, a perfect, any other perfect product, if you had a perfect camera and you had another perfectly useful, slightly worse at everything, but very capable camera that costs 10 times as much, you would never buy that camera. Yeah, you would oh, even though it's a perfectly good times, working yeah. camera, you would never buy it. So that's kind of the Mac Pro situation. So originally we were like, well, we can sell it, right? So we looked on eBay. Yeah. Because this is what we've done with like old computers and gear in the past. And there are a couple Mac Pros on eBay. Very few. I think Very few. I maybe found 10. I found one comparable, mm -hmm. sold for about 11 grand. And that was as sold. Um, a lot of the other ones were far, far, far smaller specs. I mean, some of them were like 32 or 64 gigs of RAM. Yeah. And just for context, I basically maxed out the Mac Pro other did. than the RAM. Other, had, which was still 768. I had 768 gigs of yeah. RAM, so I didn't have the 1.5 terabytes, but I uh -huh. had the 28 core, I had the afterburner, I had dual Vega Pro 2 Duos. Mm -hmm. That thing was very, that was beefed up. So yeah, the closest thing we could find was someone listing it for 11 grand, they, they but did not sell sold. It. Nope, they they did sold it for 11. Okay, yeah. they sold it for 11. Um, and doing something like that is like, it's nice that you can get, you know, 11 grand isn't anywhere near what we spent, Ooh. but you could get that money back and you have to ship it and you have to obviously erase it fully and send it to the person who hopefully can get it working again. If they have any problems, they're probably going to look back to you. There's a lot of other questions about dust and like cleaning it out and making sure we're getting them something that they expect to be in like perfect condition, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Um, and we did all that. And we did all that, and we cleaned it out, and it's in working order. And then we tried to list it, and eBay has, uh, I don't know if you guys know about seller limits on eBay, yeah. but if you mysteriously pop up as a new user on eBay and suddenly start listing a bunch of stuff, you can get your account suspended for suspicious activity because it looks like you stole a bunch of stuff and started listing it to sell it. Yeah, we have we haven't had the best track record with eBay <laughs> Probably yeah. mostly our fault. I can't totally blame eBay because we've done like, we'll do a big clean out of phones and we'll try and sell them for a really good price because we want people to be able to get some some good stuff. Yeah. We always sell it as like totally used when it's almost brand new, but reasonably so eBay sees you selling like 10 phones. It's a reasonable policy. Or like, yeah, and then they yeah. get mad. We've had our account suspended a couple of times. Um, yeah. So we've gotten brought back. Imagine what that looks like to it eBay. It looks terrible. An account I mean, pops up and suddenly lists 10 phones. The first time they asked for what? receipts and I couldn't give them an answer for it because yeah. they're old review units and yeah. everything like that. So it stinks, but there's still a seller limit. And the only way you can break through that seller limit is if you're consistently selling. So they assume you as a store and that seller limit's 5,000. 5,000. Um, so at that point, you, there's even a button that says request a higher seller limit. You click it and it says not able to, yeah. or for us at we least. We haven't been account. active enough on eBay. Yeah. So 5,000 was the most we could get. Plus we'd have to ship it. Plus we'd have to ensure the shipment. Plus we'd have to make sure everything got there in, in good working order. And then I looked up um, Apple's trade-in program. Yeah. Now, Apple's trade-in program is a pretty big ripoff. Like, for m most of the stuff, you you send it in, like, you put in your serial number, you put in your specs, and then the money you get back is just a gift card for Apple. Mm -hmm. So you get to spend that on more Apple stuff in the future. Luckily, you know, we buy enough computers that we'll probably eventually spend it, but... We'll obviously eventually. use Apple money. <laughs> yeah, so we uh, we punched in the serial number and the the specs of the Max that Mac Pro, and the thing I spent 42 grand on two years ago, it shot me back a value of 4,700 something dollars, $4,700. Yeah. And that's a pretty big bummer, but it is minus all of the headache of selling it, shipping it, insuring it, 
and all that. With all of that plus eBay's fees, it probably and actually would have been more money than selling it on eBay for the max listed price. Mathematically, it did turn out to be more because if we got our five grand, if we just listed it at exactly our max, mm -hmm. which was, okay, one item. We can only sell one this month, but we're going to sell it for our max at $5,000. And it's going to take 500 bucks to ship it. And it's going to take 300 bucks to insure it in FedEx by yeah. shipping something that expensive. And I'm probably going to have to, what was the other thing? Oh, eBay takes a cut eBay takes out of a cut. all yeah. of that. That would have been actually less than the money Apple was giving. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, well, whatever Apple's going to do with it, whether it's recycle it or use those parts for repairing other people's Mac Pros, I don't know what they're going to do, but they're willing to take it off my hands and give me $4,700 of credit. I've gotten, at this point, I've gotten my value out of that Mac Pro. Yeah. I've, I understand in my heart this I'm is... not going to get 50 grand out of that computer yeah. anymore. No one in their right mind would spend that much on it. I'm fine with taking this L. It, it's, it's a hard, tough pill to swallow because of how much you spent on it. In our situation, with a couple of factors, it does wind up being, it hurts to say, but it makes sense. Biggest fact, we got two years out of it. We saved endless amount of time using it like it's been worth its I price just for two years of editing probably 200 videos on that yeah thing. we made content on it so we mm -hmm. literally profited off of it and the second the mac studio got announced that thing's value just tanked plummeted it's just unless you're someone who needs to use intel for compatibility reasons on whatever software you've got it makes no sense that are the gpus that. Yeah, I, it I, still has the GPU power advantage for certain apps that are looking for those GPUs. Like for our workflow, yeah, it yeah. doesn't make that much sense because we don't use all that GPU power. But mm -hmm. like, yeah, for a Final Cut Studio like we are, those the value plummeted. So, yeah, and if, if we were going to get somebody to pay all of that value that they really saw on it, it would still get swallowed up by eBay's fees. So this well, turned yeah, out we can't. Yeah. yeah, this turned out to actually be the best thing for us to do with it. So. I, I went ahead and hit the accept button, and basically what they do is they send you a FedEx uh, QR code. Mm -hmm. We put it back in its original box. I just yeah. pulled that thing into my car, brought it to FedEx. Oh, you brought it to FedEx. I brought it to FedEx, okay. and I put it on the on the stand, and they went, oh, a Mac Pro. And then I said, <laughs> here's this QR code, and they scanned it, and they were like, oh, okay, yeah, it's free. They shipped it, packed it, and it was out of my hands that day. I thought you were going to bring it to the Apple Store because that was an option, and I really, really wanted to see you. What, what they said. It was, yeah, it's that, that I'm not sure you would have gotten the exact same dollar amount because I think there's still one last step of that needs to get to Apple and they take it out the box and evaluate it and make sure it's still in good condition and all that stuff. They can confirm they're ripping they you can, off They can now. confirm exactly how much money they want to give you for it. And I, I bet if you went into the Apple store, they would look at it and go, oh, the box is dented. It's going to be minus the X dollars. But whatever. Uh -huh. that We took care of it. It's off our hands. And that's what happened to the Mac Pro. So, yeah. Starting right now, here's the funny part. Starting right now, Mac Studio is editing everything right now. Yeah. I fully expect to be back on the new Mac Pro when it comes out. And yes. I think we will turn that Mac Studio that I've been using into another editor's machine or someone mm -hmm. else's machine because it is that good at everything that we need it to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, but for that new Mac Pro when it does come out, I think we're still going to use a little bit extra horses on the GPU stuff, on the plugins, on the on the maxed out stuff. So... We'll see when that comes out. I'm just speculating. But yes, as of right now, that's what happened to our Mac Pro. That's the story. Mac Pro. Sad day. Sad. Yeah. Don't, what's it? Don't cry because it's over. Be happy Smile because, because it, happened it happened or something like that. Yeah. yeah. We, it was a good machine. It was a great cheese grater. It was a good machine. We loved it. We love it. Well, I think that's a good place to take a quick break. We'll mm -hmm. take a quick pause. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk about place when we come back. But before we do that. Adam came up with a fun little idea we're going to start implementing into all of our episodes. Um, basically, he's going to hit us with a trivia question before each ad break, mm -hmm. and then we're going to take our time to think about it, and then we're going to come back. You and I are going to guess, so we'll have the whole episode to think about it. We'll guess at the end, and then Adam will reveal the answers, the answers at okay. the end. So just a little, little fun thing for everyone to be thinking about. You know, maybe you're on your commute to work and when we're getting boring talking about the place you can think about what the answer to the episode the question might be and yeah uh, you'll no find googling out allowed no, no googling go i like that especially if you're driving no googling allowed if you're driving fair rule cool. all right what are we uh what are we looking at for week one of trivia okay carl pay the ceo of nothing and co-founder of OnePlus, grew up in which european country mm. that's a good one we'll be right back 
Oh yeah, I'm not supposed to answer it. Right? <laughs> <laughs>All right, welcome back. Let's talk about April Fool's Day 2022. We didn't have a whole lot of amazing April Fool's Day projects. Ours ours is amazing. What was our? Our short. Our short. That was a fun one. Okay, if you haven't seen that, which was interesting. By the way, we keep trying this like uh, vertical video format on different mediums Mm because it was a short and we made it for shorts. Yeah. But there are other mediums where that like kind of works for a while. And even if you don't like keep watching it in the future, it's fun for the day to see a video like that. We put it on TikTok. Instagram Reels, and YouTube Shorts. And Twitter. And Twitter. All good places for videos. Um, And for like the third or fourth consecutive time we've done this, Instagram Reels has been the top performer. Like destroyed them, right? Yeah. I mean, this one was closer. It was like 2.2 million versus 1.6. But like Instagram Reels is pretty Instagram Reels is doing pretty awesome, yeah. But yeah, yeah. As far as April Fool's projects, we didn't do a whole main channel video. We did see a couple good ones. I really like Linus's video. He just did. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of memed his own sponsored reads to the point. Good. But Genius, a- apparently got like full paid for yeah, all of yeah. them, which I thought they were just joke reads, but he just kept going and they were all real. It was good great for him. For them, yeah. Uh, so there, there were some good ones. We talked about Dyson's non April Fool's Day thing, but <laughs> probably our favorite April Fool's Day actual project was Reddit reviving r slash place. Yes. We talked to Josh Wardle a couple weeks ago who was sort of on the team responsible for the original version of mm-hmm. this, where they basically just have one place on the internet where anyone can place one pixel every five minutes correct yeah and it's this huge canvas and so inevitably communities get together and they sort of like plan stuff and band together and will like they would crowdsource art they would make art you could say that together um which is a bit of a dangerous exercise because hey communities will decide whatever they want to do and put it wherever they want i mean josh specifically said that he was like our biggest worry in the original one in 2017 was inappropriate objects there's just gonna be phallic images everywhere and apparently that's how it started but then people sort of like adjusted (laughs) and started making more wholesome stuff the the first time right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think he did (laughs) say there was some stuff that they were a little worried about at first but um it happened again this year they brought brought it back back. we kind of all knew it was coming back i believe the day before um and they went on for four days and i followed it very intensely. So this one, this time we got involved a little bit. We got very involved. Because I, uh, I, I had a stressful weekend, if I'm being honest. So I guess the funny part is, is that it was four days long. Yes. So if you drew something on the first day, there's a very low chance that it would still be there if you didn't come back for four days. But on the other hand, if you waited too long, the whole thing would be so crowded yes. with so many different mm-hmm. communities looking for spots to build their own art that you would be out of space. So we had to yeah. find this like happy medium of like, we do want something there. Do we just go for it on day one? And we did, yeah. right? We want I, I can kind top. of give a little brief yeah. overview here. I think yeah. I wanted to, I split it into two things in my notes here. Um, I kind of have what happened on our place in general and then what happened with our community building things on our place. So what's what did the overall our place look like? Okay, so it started off, Almost exactly how it did in 2017. One canvas, I believe, is a thousand by a thousand pixels. So one million pixels. It's not very much. Um, and the biggest difference here, if you think about it, is in 2017, it popped up with zero instructions. No one knew what to do. So the first few hours was just pure chaos. Yeah. This time around, this thing goes live and communities are just already banding together. We Immediate. have there's Discord servers, there's uh, subreddits people are creating new subreddits just for the subreddits beforehand to just find ways we had streamers jumping on and bringing their audience in there's all sorts of different things and immediately this thing was filling up with yep. um different images i think when i first logged in there was there was a bunch of country flags yes huge so, flags which I, yeah. I that shouldn't shock me people are very like attached to, and there's there's lots of huge communities to mm-hmm. do that people like representation too. i think there was a huge ukraine blue and yellow across the entire thing which was yeah. pretty wholesome i think there was a star wars poster there is a star wars poster in the yeah in the canvas um yeah. there's a couple old memes from the first one which included so in the First one, there was a Windows 98 taskbar at the bottom. This one eventually, actually, I guess not off the start, but they made a Windows XP taskbar. 
There's something called the blue corner in the first one, which was basically just a corner that was completely blue. Sure. That started in this one as well. Sure. In the top left corner, there was the old school RuneScape disconnected message, which is when you used to play the game. Anytime you had server issues, it would pop up. So they built that into the place. That's a big community. Yeah. And like you said, lots and lots of flags. So in, in this first day, immediately we wanted to build something. So I got on our Discord server, I tweeted out that we wanted to do the waveform logo. I think we mentioned it in the podcast last week. Mm-hmm. Um, so we pick a spot. It was right ne- next to a French flag. So it had a red border already that felt like a really easy thing to oh. reference and draw. Off I of. remember when you guys were picking this yeah, and decided. Yeah. And I, you can log in and you can see every pixel. You hover over it and you can see it has a the user. Oh, yeah. yeah you can yeah. see the user that placed that picture, that pixel. Yeah. And you could zoom out a little bit and you could see exactly the names of. Uh, the coordinates of every yeah. single one. So you'd picked that place because it was a nice little spot that was unoccupied. To me, it was a space that was unoccupied and everyone wants to go for corners and sides at first because it's the easiest to coordinate from. So we went to a, a French flag pixel, which um, very quickly Adam found out was where the Elden Ring subreddit and yeah. Discord community were starting to build, which is massive. massive. I actually think somebody at the end of all this did a... Um, a breakdown of which communities had the most pixels and Elden Ring was in the top 20. So we picked a rough opponent to start with. It was with. funny because it wasn't there at all when we nope. started. And, then and we started black. to build our logo there. I think I dropped like four pixels. And mm-hmm. I had like every five minutes, you're like, all right, I got a new pixel. And I drop it in. And then I refreshed once and it was just like gone. Yep. Like all of it just it got out. dominated in like two minutes. We had a very, very modest 15 by 15 pixel logo. That yeah. was, ve- we were not trying to take a lot of space. I mean- the the French flag that we were building next to was probably like a hundred pixels tall. I mean, oh. like giant compared so to a hundred by a hundred. Is a, you get? Oh uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what the dimensions were, but oh, it was it's, taller. It's they were taller than they were also. But okay. either way, so um, that was our first step. Just to like give a little hint of where our went, we we got covered by Elden Ring. We actually talked to someone from Elden Ring put it directly above theirs to use their border, and then they decided to expand and just wipe this out again completely. Oh, so That's a vibrant community. When you overshoot, because that was the thing, when you when you do the math and you're like, all right, we want to make a 100 by 100 thing. Not too crazy, just 100 by 100. Yeah. That's 10,000 pixels you have to actively <laughs> maintain. That is so many people it's that need wild. to be online at once yeah. fighting for this spot. And to overshoot and be like, well, we, we kind of dominated our spot. Like, why don't we just keep going? Yeah, that's pretty serious. So, good, good job, Elden Ring subreddit. You definitely, yeah. uh, you, you definitely killed, took you those pixels. Us. We died. Yeah, we died. So, um, we, what do we find a new spot? So, yeah, we found a new spot. Um, actually, funny enough, right over lttstore.com. Oh, yeah. There happened to be some blank space up there. That's where we nestled in, created our logo, had no trouble for a little while until a Croatian flag above us started taking over. Mm. Um. We defended against them for a while, but it wasn't looking great. Then a Pokemon started getting built next to us. I believe, <laughs> let me just, this I want to like get the like a fever name. dream. The, it it's is the most random thing. It is very, very interesting kind of what happens because there's this, like, what's really fun about it is you like create friends with and allies with these other communities and they're generally communities you've never, I mean, obviously we know LTT stored. None of them attacked us. We never attacked them. Oh, that's it's good. fun being next to each other as far as I know. It's good, Linus. It's Thanks. good. It's good. <laughs> Thanks, Linus. Yeah. Um, let's see. The Pokemon next to us was called Swablu. How I, does that I have believe. a community? So, okay. It's literally just that. Funnily enough, somebody from that community listened to our podcast last week. Mm-hmm. recognized that it was us trying to build it, came into our Discord server and created a truce, and we actually wound up sharing a few pixels in between them and wound up defending. What? And they had already built an alliance with Croatia. So we all worked into the Croatian flag. So we actually became allies with Croatia, um, Swablu, and I believe it's an anime called Nerve. <laughs> the sentence is um, unbelievable. Yeah. So that okay. was our kind of like little place. And what's funny about this is I'm going to call this, we have a spot on the old world because after we finished that on Saturday, they decided to double the size of the canvas and add another thousand by thousand pixels to the right. And then later on that day, they actually doubled that again. So now it's four times the original canvas. So we're on the original thousand by thousand. Yes, our logo is on the original thousand by thousand. This is kind of like the old world, which is really fun. But um, after they doubled that and 
quadrupled it is when a lot of the like pure chaos started happening and just throughout the weekend was super fun to watch. There was there's communities all over the place. There was a bunch of French streamers and a bunch of Spanish streamers banding together to build new flags and stuff like that. There's a lot of just one streamer I like was like they would attack different places they didn't like. Um, there was also a group of like kind of trolls called the Dark Void, which would in random places throughout the map, they would pick a community, attack it in this, they would just turn the whole thing black and this like black dissolving void and then like some sort of demonic face would start coming out of it. And then all of a sudden it would disappear back to what it originally was. What it was wild. Um, they made some really, really cool uh are all over the place like you said star wars a couple of my favorite were like a lot of the flags are really cool so originally the french flag the irish flag got built underneath it and at their border where they crossed um france drew a wine bottle so ireland responded with a guinness pint underneath it nice. and they both started adding references to their countries like stemming from the middle of them wow um, a lot of the nordic countries did stuff like that too um, they I'm all trying kind to think of, like, of any of these together. countries are Carl Pay's country. <laughs> <I have laughs> Is no that idea. all you're thinking about for the rest a of the It's video? bouncing around in there in my skull right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of taking over. On Saturday, our Discord, without even being prompted, actually wound up finding a space in the second canvas and creating a pixel art of Mac and the Waveform logo which held true for a really long time, actually, until sometime on Sunday got completely taken over by what felt like some bot accounts because one of my biggest complaints here is there's obviously a lot of botting happening because some things you can be consistent with and have large communities work together, but some are just too obvious. And there was a lot of, when you would click that name under the pixel, it would have like a account made that day. And I saw that uh, probably 50% of the time I would click a pixel, which hmm. is one of my bigger gripes okay. about the whole thing. Um, so body. we lost Mac and Waveform. We lost Mac and Waveform. Um, but just like without attempting to gatekeep Reddit and our place, I'm fine with people using alt accounts because that feels like it's part of Reddit. But doing same day accounts in this just felt like such an easy way to game the whole thing and like yeah. a little too... Uh, it's less know. wholesome. It's way less You're wholesome. You're supposed to yeah, just yeah, use your own sure. normal account. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Actually, just real quick, I have in the doc, if you click, I have the 2017 version, and we can put this up on the screen, um, the 2017 version and the 2021 version, and you can just kind of see the difference in scale between them. 2017's got a big flag right in the middle. It's got a Mona, Mona Lisa. Lisa. I see the Linux penguin. A lot of very We're actually visually... really close to the Linux penguin on the new one. Of course um, the Linux penguin very is close. on both. All right, 2021. Yeah. Oh, wow, that took a while to load. That was huge. The 2021 one is gigantic. I mean, I think I mentioned some of my favorites. The flags are all really good. It's less clear um, who has the largest piece of art right now. In this, so in if this you look, one. France has like the bottom left corner, which is crazy. Oh, and then that whole thing is That's France. not even what I'm talking about. The one I'm talking about is closer to the left hand top quarter portion. And it has an Eiffel Tower and the moon and a wine glass. And one thing they did that was really cool is they basically knew time lapses would be created of this. So yeah. the wine bottle, they had the liquid go slowly down and then they built it back up and the glass would change on the side. And they were like, some people were literally animating some so things that's, in here. This, is, this brings me to, this was my favorite part of like, I saw like the chaos and like you guys talking to the Discord for mm -hmm. a couple of days and then the Slack over the weekend. My favorite thing that came out of this was at the end of it, since it was a four day event of people placing these pixels over yeah. and over again, is the time lapse that they made of how this thing Correct. exploded yeah. into existence and then like ebbed and flowed and things appeared and disappeared over yeah. time. And that was sick. Watch so that if you get a chance. That's where you can see the dark void that I was talking about. Yeah. It just kind of shows up all over the place. Um, another thing I loved among us, while they didn't end with a lot of things, they probably paid played one of the biggest roles in this whole weekend because constantly giant Among Us characters would just show up in the middle of nowhere. At one point, the entire left-hand corner was just small, like four by four pixels of Among Us characters. And then rather than expanding that, they decided to go into other art pieces and take the colors and go one off of all the colors and make Among Us characters that were hidden inside oh. of the images yeah. around it to the point where I think someone created an AI that scanned for all of them 
and found like over 2,000 of them <laughs> littered around the entire canvas, just like small Among Us characters wow. all over the place. Um, it was really, really cool. Uh, I'll get back into, because I couldn't handle Mac getting destroyed. So There's Monday- There's so many other dogs on here, I'm saying. There are a lot of dogs, yeah. Um, but on Monday, our Discord had been fighting all day Sunday, and we unfortunately lost that battle. But on Monday, I decided it, we, we had to finish this. It was ending on Monday afternoon, so I hopped on our Discord. I fired up my stream, which I haven't done in like three years, and our Discord community just went off the rails trying to make this happen. We shrunk Mac a little bit. We finally, I think after five tries of, of fighting people and losing, found a spot that we could defend. It also helped Sam Sheffer came in saw my stream and then brought his whole audience in and we kind of all battled together and it probably took like four hours but we finally wow. got mac on the canvas accurately defended him um nice. and he's there it seems the like streamers would have the most would have the best audience to do something like this because they were they're nuts. all engaged they're all plugged in and they're all here in the same place together at the same time they would literally just like pick somewhere and say attack and then you would watch <laughs> it on screen just turn black and That's then something crazy. else pop up um wow. But yeah, this, to me, this is like one of the coolest online social experiment kind of things we've ever witnessed. It was way different this year because everyone knew what to do. So yeah. there's far more creativity. I mean, there's like full blown Renaissance paintings in here. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff. I found a Waldo. Where's Waldo? Did you really? There's one near the, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not even going to say where it is, but okay, I found you Waldo. Can find it. Yeah. yeah, it was right here. Lots of sports teams, lots of flags, lots of video game references and anime references. Um, yeah. There's a lot of things. Someone created an atlas where you could go in, and now the MKBHD logo and Mac are officially oh. recorded in the atlas nice. for this final one. Nice. Um, and then it all ended where towards the last couple hours, you could only place white pixels. So essentially they made it so everyone would just place white pixels until the whole canvas turned back white. Uh, and then they it was lost into the void. Wow. Not before people got screenshots and time lapses of everything. So like we'll definitely put some stuff in the show notes for people to check out time lapses. But mm -hmm. um, as a small, I mean, like we're a big channel, but we're still kind of like small community in comparison to like entire countries, right? Yeah, Elden or, Ring. Or Elden Ring, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was really, really fun to have our Discord and our Reddit and other people's discords like band together. Th this is all a really cool experience. And like, to me, this is what Discord feels like. It's about like our community just all came together. No one fought about anything. They just like wondered where pixels had to go, placed pixels and defended it for four days straight, days. essentially. Um, huh. I, I have to give one shout out to someone in our Discord named Bangle Game who literally like 20 times over the weekend, he built a spreadsheet with each pixel mm -hmm. and then each what color it should be and a hyperlink to the pixel on the page. And he constantly updated it every that's time we, we had need. to move pixels. It that's was crazy. That's, um, that's the that's the conductor at the front of the train. Like, he was, like he everybody all aboard, like this is what we're doing. He was our mastermind behind Incredible. it all. Um, Tim obviously created the logos. Adam was fighting the whole time. He was the one scoping out who, he was the one who found Elden Ring was about to destroy <laughs> us. He was our lookout tower, I guess. Um, but it was, it was super, super fun. Huge shout out to our Discord, to Twitter, to Twitch, to everybody who helped us. Um, and also shout out to Linus who's let's just say his place thing didn't come out exactly how they were uh, it, it was close. expecting it to it come out. Like it looks like it got close. close. I liked it, yeah. It got close. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was super fun. That's the place. I, I do have to say, I hope they don't do this every year. It's different when it's every few years. It feels more special. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, this was good. I'm glad yeah. they did it. Super fun, yeah. Sick. All right, let's take another quick break. We'll come back. Dave is going to talk to Jad from Radio Lab. And then we'll get on with our trivia answers. Do we have another question here? We're going to add one? Yeah, we'll do one each ad break. All right, let's cool. add a trivia question. Yeah, let's, let's brainstorm a bit. Okay, so the headphones you guys are wearing right now are the Audio-Technica ATH M50Xs. Yep. Mm -hmm. What year were they released in? I'm phoning a friend. Okay. Marquez is the friend. I have an idea. All right, that's a good one. That's a good one. BRB. Cool. All right, welcome back. 
So as we mentioned from the beginning, this last bit here for this week, we have a guest, mm-hmm. and it's Jad from Radio Lab. David actually got to speak to him and and went over sort of his origins and the beginnings of like podcasting as a whole. It's really in depth and and really interesting. We've done this podcast thing for two and a half years. Is that right? Two years. We're at one hundred and ten episodes. Is that including so, audio and video, yes. or just audio? Audio and vi- video. Yeah. So we have a little. Or no, no, sorry, audio only. Yeah, audio only. So we yeah. have a a good amount. That seems like a long time, actually. But this is a man who's been in the thick of it for way longer than we have. Far so longer. So we'll let David talk to him, and then we'll come back at the end and go over our trivia question answers. Yeah. Take it away, David. All right. Well, uh, I guess do you want to just start off with your name and what you've done for your whole life and <laughs> <laughs> what you're into and. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is Jad Abumrad. I created a show called Radio Lab and a couple of related podcasts and radio shows, and uh, that has been the last two decades. But I recently um, announced I'm moving on from that, and uh, it's funny. I think I, I think when I announced, you reached out to me, right? Or did I reach out to you? I, I, don't... T- I tweeted that you had an incredibly long and great career yes and then you reached out to me and i saw your byline and i was like oh shit. oh can i, can I <laughs> yeah can you I, can I, okay i was like oh shit you work it with you work out out here at mk mkbhd i don't even know what you call the actual umbrella thing uh yeah uh, that's basically what we call it okay <laughs> yeah but i was yeah. i've been a a massive consumer of your tech videos uh and i have seen this space maybe 55 times in the in those videos so when you reach out i was like oh my god can i come over yeah and see the space <laughs> so i'm his is basically me forcing my way in well so. when you dm'd me back and followed me i had the same reaction so <laughs> <laughs> we'll just call it mutual mutual right, positivity cool 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 <laughs> so you've been you've been like building podcasts for 20 plus years yeah since um before I mean, they were podcasts before it well or as as most people as as i like to call podcasts radio right exactly <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah it's amazing to me like people who, who are in podcasting now are just like they feel like they're inventing something and uh and they are i mean everybody is everybody's inventing themselves every day but like i when i first started radio lab which was first a radio show and it was i was airing early documentaries from from like the golden age of radio and so i was listening to a lot of that stuff and when you start to listen to like orson wells in 1930 you realize nothing that we are doing is original. Right. It's all been done. Yeah. And I find that quite liberating. Mm. But uh, I'm curious about that, though. When you say, do you you mean that everything you've made has been a a mixture of other things that you listen to? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Isn't that, isn't everybody? Yeah. Um, Derivative. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. We all get credited for doing things that we might not, I don't know that we deserve all the credit we get. Mm -hmm. I say we, meaning all people who make stuff. Yeah. But specifically Radio Lab gets credited as like doing something new to podcasting. And maybe maybe we did, but uh it's it was just generational. Like that stuff right. existed before us, um, like way before us. Right. Um and uh and so so yeah, I don't feel like I invented anything. I feel like I just recombined stuff in a new way, but not even in a new way. But isn't that what inventing is in a way? Yeah. Everything else is built of everything else before it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But we forget. Yeah. Right. We forget. Right. Um, seriously, you should should listen to like the shadow radio dramas from the 1930s. Mm. Not only are they amazing and like terrifying, like in a horror movie kind of way, they're mm-hmm. really scary. Mm-hmm. You just realize like, oh, we're all just like we're just like riding the coattails of like I mean, it, radio was invented in 1920. By 1938, they'd done everything. They literally fixed. They <laughs> they they'd done everything. Yeah. And so we're just kind of mixing the same stew. Yeah, is what I feel like. Yeah, but in a different yeah. conglomerate way. You know? Yeah, with new digital. I mean, I think audio. that with podcasts in particular, um, because like you said, Radio Lab was like a thing before podcasting was really a thing, right? Yeah. So, what was that transition into? You, I mean, I know you still call it radio versus podcasts, but like, what was that transition like from? airing on the radio and like hoping people would hear it transitioning into people actively deciding to download yeah podcasts and just become fans of a of a show they could listen to at any time yeah well that that transition that you just articulated from like serendipitously just being in the car and it happens to be on to like people subscribing and actively consuming it 
that made all the difference for, mm-hmm. for us. Like it, a radio lab never really made sense on the radio, you know, because mm-hmm. it's so highly produced. There's so many layers. It's so musical and it's fast, right? It moves very quickly. Um, it, when you're driving and you're trying to like figure out whether you should take a left turn or a right turn or like when you're in your kitchen doing the dishes and the kids are screaming, it's, it can be a hard show to listen to because mm. you're having to like to divide your brain in a way that that is difficult with a show like Radio Lab. It's not a divided brain kind of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it was, I don't want to say languishing on the radio, but it had like a, a small band of followers, but mm-hmm. very, very kind of way off in the margins. And then podcasting came along, 2006, like OG podcasting, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You still have um, to sync your iPod to the computer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people forget that podcasting yeah. is kind of old, right? Actually, yeah. Um, and uh, when that came along, and you could suddenly stop and start, and you were telling the story, and you were deep in someone's ear canal, mm-hmm. right? Um, suddenly, the show made sense. You know, like, oh, we were making for this medium. We didn't realize it, but mm. we were making for the medium that just appeared, mm. and. Uh, and then we just got lucky. We made a thing. And then Ira Glass at This American Life promoted it. And then suddenly, like, our audience went, like, from, like, here to boink. Oh, all the really? Way up here. And then suddenly the rest was history. Um, I don't know. It was weird. I mean, we were we were there right at the beginning when podcasting became, like, that first wave of big shows. Yeah. Uh, we, we just, I don't know. It's, it's weird. Like, we're a product of the historical window that we were in, mm-hmm. which was between um, public radio I mean, not even public radio. Like all that existed was This American Life and a few other shows, and yeah. then news, right? Yeah, yeah. So we were coming out of that like space, and then suddenly podcasting happened, and we got grandfathered in in a way, and then suddenly we were a massive podcast. But um, I, it was it's funny. It's funny to look back on like how much luck played into it. Mm. Like if I were to start Radio Lab now, I don't think it would have the same trajectory because podcasting is an established thing and did it feel like it like popped off instantaneously or was it like a a slow growth that just eventually got big it was that it was slow yeah yeah it's like inverse power law right? yeah yeah <laughs> we, were, we were in the long pre-tail for a long, uh-huh. long time and then finally i'd say around 2008 or nine hmm. Uh, somewhere in that zone i have a theory and i would like you to i would like to see if you agree with it oh please yeah um the mobile internet and the ability to sort of download anything at any time over wirelessly, um, I think sort of allowed people to just listen to whatever they wanted at any time. Yeah. And it's funny because you, you mentioned earlier, like podcasting is actually kind of old. Yeah. But the ability, but, po- but podcasts in general have only really seen mass popularity in the last like decade or even less. And it, to me, it feels like it's mostly just people having the ability to listen to whatever they want, whatever they want, without having to, you know, plug their iPod into a computer and sync something and just like reducing layers of, of friction and complexity in that system. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would actually double down a little bit and say when Apple baked in the podcast app to yeah. the phone, yeah, that was a huge moment, right? Suddenly it was this thing that was on your phone and then anybody could like one day flip through and be like, huh, what is that? Let me yeah. click that. Yeah. Um, and like that was a massive moment. And that happened like one or two, like we were around, a few other podcasts were around and gaining popularity. That happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the rise of the wireless mobile internet was happening. And then serial happened. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so all of those things kind of came together at once. And then suddenly uh, – it became like a meme at that point. Like it became, it became, uh, you know, spoofed on Saturday Night Live, and like mm-hmm. people were writing articles about it, mm-hmm. and it became like an idea that was talked about in the culture. Um, but it, it had been around for a while. Mm-hmm. Maybe things were playing catch up. Mm. You know, the, the technologies were maturing, and uh, and also like there were shows that you know there were there was uh, This American Life, there was Us, there were other shows that had back catalogs that people could dive into. Yeah, at that point. So, um, yeah, we just happen. It's, it's funny to just be standing in the street in the middle of the street when all the cars show up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you feel excited about that, but you also feel like, I don't know that I necessarily did this. Mm-hmm. It just like 
14 things came together that I had no control over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like we obviously create a lot of YouTube videos here and we recently about a year ago switched to doing YouTube podcasts as well. Um, And I remember when I was, I used to like watch YouTube live shows all the time, but they weren't really podcasts and there were podcasts that weren't really live shows. Yeah. And I feel like that's a sort of recent convergence. Mm -hmm. And I know that even um, Radio Lab started putting, they made a YouTube channel and started putting stuff on there. How is that? How do you see like the future of video and storytelling in a podcast format? Because it's kind of weird, right? Because like video and audio are very different mediums. And we did episodes back when uh, we were only an audio uh, show that I felt like it was a lot easier to sort of create that world in your head and tell the story with sound yeah. effects and all these things. Suddenly, if we we're sitting here with cameras, which we are, which we are, it's a, a little different. You can't really force someone into that world as much because they're also in the real world sitting here with us. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it's. It is. It is a weird experience to have. I mean, these three very beautiful looking cameras you have pointed at us. Um, and each of them has their little monitors showing different images of us. Yeah. That's a totally different experience than like making, (laughs) (laughs) making a podcast in an airless booth and then putting it out and knowing that you're just going to be into people's minds and not into their eyeballs. Right. Um, but that said, you know, I mean, I, I feel like if the conversation is good, it does, I mean, you just kind of want to be where people are at. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and uh, having a conversation. I mean, would we do an episode of Radio Lab the way we're doing this now? No, you know. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking to somebody, what do I do when I'm like, when Terry Gross is talking to somebody? I'm like, oh, that's that's fascinating. I go and look at what I, I look them up on the internet, mm-hmm. and then within ten seconds, I know what they look like. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it it isn't it isn't that much of a stretch. Mm-hmm. What are we actually talking about? We're talking about having a conversation. <laughs> yeah. And we're talking about telling a story. There's some yeah. like there's age old things that we just wrap new words around. But so I don't know. I guess I guess it was more like the convergence of the audio and video mediums in that storytelling format. Mm. I, do you see that as being like because we have movies, right? And we have YouTube videos and they're sort of the same thing. But it's different from like a podcast where you create an entire world in someone's head and bring them through sound effects. And mm-hmm. do you think that there is a a place for a, a merging of those two things where you're able to like use the sound effects and yeah create those universes? Oh, and, like a merging of like a podcast on YouTube, but that's using sound in the way Radio Lab. Does. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Mm, I mean, it, it maybe. I mean, it, it it really depends on it, it depends on uh, what what you're doing to people's eyes right mm-hmm. if it's a literal representation of two people talking then, yeah. then it would like it would be strange to watch us and then suddenly hear sound effects commingling <laughs> right <with us. laughs> that's but yeah, that's uh, a weird thing there are all kinds of like essayists on i mean you do essays I, there are mm-hmm. all kinds of essayists on youtube who are creating uh narrative experiences which feel like podcasts yeah right yeah and which are using sound in artful ways um but those are more like movies, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, I don't know. There's so right. much. It's, it's weird, right? Yeah. We sort of define things in categories, but. No, the, the categories don't, don't make sense as yeah. much anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's like, I, I feel like there's, there's just a, the thing that happens in the first 10 seconds of anything, mm. which is if it's, if it's a podcast, it's, it, if it's a video where you just, you establish the rules for the experience. Mm-hmm. And whatever you do in those 10 seconds can can permit anything mm-hmm. i feel like whether mm-hmm. it's crazy sounds or or completely naturalistic two people sitting in a room talking yeah you know? yeah yeah so you you grew up doing music engineering right and you moved into podcasting from that yeah music i mean music engineering would be yeah, composition i was right yeah okay i mean one of my favorite things so i i went to music school before i fell through the side door into into podcasting and uh i went to like one of those music schools that taught you music in a way that's completely useless but (laughs) but fascinating i mean it was i learned like about music concrete and all these things that no one cares about anymore Hmm. but i remember coming out of music school and i and i had just like taken a whole course on stockhausen and the way that he used sounds from the real world as music Mm -hmm. and the first few few radio labs that I made, I was like, what would Stockhausen do? Like, how, how would, 
how would he tell the story? Mm -hmm. So you hear a lot of strange noises and, and sounds and, and it was really just like me trying to be a composer, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. And then as I learned the journalism and I learned how to tell a story and how to interview and all those like more journalistic things, um, the music just became a way to like augment all that, mm. you know, at first it was very much like, I want to be a composer. And then I realized, oh no, I'm actually, what I think I am is a journalist who, who speaks music, mm. you know? And when you say speak, can you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> it's like creating the musical version of, of a conversation or a story. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. Like the language that I speak into the story is a musical language, but what I'm trying to do is basic journalism on the front end of it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. 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 And you said, you said that, you know, now that you're retired, you're going to be doing more music stuff. What kind of music stuff is that going to be? What well, does that look like? I don't know if I'm re see, retired is a funny word. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not that old. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, you know, it just, it was time for a new chapter. And um, I am actually, I have a couple of music commissions I'm working through. Hmm. Um, I have like a ton of music I'm writing that probably no one will ever hear, um, but that I'm really enjoying. And, um, you know, like, I mean, do you, you want to hear it? I mean, I can tell you about the music, yeah, but sure. it's like, yeah. I, I almost am embarrassed to talk about it because it's just, it's like one of those little like things you do that you almost feel like, why would anyone listen to this? But I, I'm, I'm writing a ton of music that's um, meant to be listened to when you're asleep. Oh, so I'm doing like th I'm doing these like hour long pieces that are timed to REM cycles that use some of the um, the brainwave frequencies that people uh, have when they sleep as musical content. And I'm sort of creating like um, mm. like nocturnes around that basically. So uh, quite literally, no one will ever listen to it <laughs> when they're <laughs> conscious. Um, yeah. And so you know, I'm doing that, which is just like a fun project. And um, does that like help people sleep, or is it sort of just based around the ideas of? REM it's cycles? more based around the ideas. Okay. I'm not sure if it'll help people sleep or not. Um, and then I'm developing a few like long term projects that might be podcasts. I'm not sure. Um, helping a friend with a documentary. So I'm just kind of like playing around right now. Yeah. Um, very much in the same spirit as why I'm here. Like I was just kind of reaching out to people I really respect and admire and uh, seeing how they work. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like I'm in a, I'm in a learning mode. Right yeah, now. yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Does it feel weird to like have been doing something every week for 20 years and then flip into a new mode like that? Uh, it feels strange. It feels like um, riding a bike a little mm. bit. Um but it's feeling less and less strange. And it's just so cool to see the, just the, the breadth of people making cool things right now. Mm, um, mm -hmm. That sounds like such a like trite old man thing to say. No, but, but, but it's a, I yeah. mean, it really is amazing. Like to be here, for example, and to see, see how you guys make, make uh, videos and content. Um, the thing about the weekly deadline is that you get locked into not just that work, but that life. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. uh, in that, you're spending all your waking hours making the next podcast. And then you're also listening to like two or three podcasts ahead and editing those. Oh yeah. And so the, the entire project closes in around you mm -hmm. and you're not able to like watch TV anymore or read books or do any of the things that you know you need to do to feed mm, your that creative energy. Creative energy. Yeah. Um, I probably lived like 10 years in that space where it's just like, you project feel like an eight, yeah, you feel like an eighteen wheeler is chasing you down the street. Yeah, um, every minute of the day, and so it's been really nice to break out of that. I mean, even though I love the work and I love the people I was doing it with, I love them so much. They're so incredible. It feels nice to break out of that rhythm mm. and to just you know, like sit down and read something. Yeah, and not feel like it has to be like goal driven. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you know? just yeah, I'm just, just entertain. Read it because I want to. Yeah. And I'm still getting comfortable with that. Yeah. It's a thing. You have to train yourself to actually think that that's okay again. Mm -hmm. So I'm in that process. How long did it take you to like build a general episode from like start to finish? Because you said you were like working on multiple things at the multiple yeah. episodes at the same time. Yeah. Two to three. I mean, it, it depends. There is, there are some that are fast and fast is probably never faster than four months. Yeah. And there's some that take two years, you know, mm -hmm. of just like slow incremental work. Mm -hmm. So you're not working on it all the time. Yeah. You've got like 
12 things happening. Right. But that's reassuring because <laughs> when we do long form episodes, sometimes they take like three or four months and yeah, that's yeah. fast for me. Yeah. 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 That's super fast. I mean, just finding the story can sometimes take that long, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, like I, I think of one episode we did, which was sort of a profile of this guy who hunts big game. Mm-hmm. He, he like deliberately hunts. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. This is called the rhino hunter. Yeah. <laughs> and like he yeah. hunts uh, endangered species and he would argue he's doing it to help them. And so it's a really weird, ethical, complicated thing. Uh, just getting that guy's trust and allowing, um, getting him to allow us to trail him. Right. I took, I took years. Really? Yeah. So you expressed to me when you got here that you're really into, you're like weirdly into technology, <laughs> right? Deep. What is your favorite category of technology? My favorite category would be um, Andrew Wang, okay? You know, so you know Andrew. Right? Yeah. Hey, it's Andrew Huang. And today I am using my face to control a synthesizer setup. So like uh, watching someone like that, some crazy talented dude, make music with a balloon. Mm-hmm. Or... Um, talk about his particular modular synthesis patch that he made that makes a cool bubbly sound or um listen to various people give tutorials in ableton right Mm -hmm. so it's a lot of like music related software tutorials uh, a lot of gear stuff Mm -hmm. um and uh and then i watch you guys all the time Mm -hmm. like and i've and that has been my gateway into like video like that whole category of youtube where people talk about lenses and cameras yeah i don't know shit about any of that but i watch it all yeah (laughs) i don't know there's something about it i'm just like it's like um it's like comforting to me yeah you know yeah i i will i will never in my life buy a samsung phone Mm -hmm. but i look i watch all the videos uh, talking about the strengths and weaknesses of the samsung phones i'm Mm -hmm. like a I don't know. I just find it fascinating. Yeah, yeah. But mostly, it's audio tech is what Interesting. I is okay. what I is what I really nerd out on. Yeah, I'm sure Adam could relate to that. If you guys ever need the like deep audio nerdy take on whatever, just like call me, okay? Because I I done and done. All right, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I love that stuff. I uh, I watch way too much of it. Yeah. Is but there? You know, yeah, I is, feel like we have the same YouTube algorithm. Probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah, you probably have the same suggestions. I go really deep though. I mean, like I just like. How do you use FM synthesis to make a bass drum and that kind of stuff? Like I'll watch stuff like that for days. Um, hmm. Just like uh, how, to, how to program stuff in, in various like phase plant and those kind of synths. <laughs> I feel like I'm listening. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm hearing right now. It's, uh, there's so much. There's yeah. such a wealth of stuff out there yeah. of people who, who do that. That's what's amazing to me. I was like, man, these people can make a living on YouTube. Yeah. Maybe not a living, but something. I mean, yeah. probably, you know, it's like, know. it's, it's kind of insane. Like I, I dropped out of college and okay. ended up doing a, a job that it is not even really related to what I went to college for, you know? And so, and I learned most of the skills on YouTube. It's just wild. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the world is kind of moving towards that, you know, where they can just learn anything like audio engineering or like any of that stuff. Like you're even yeah. still watching stuff. And uh, yeah, I want to learn to play the bass. And I was like, I was just doing a, a, a search the other day and I was like, oh, dang, that could like, I don't have to go get a teacher. It's all right. Yeah, here. I know. <laughs> yeah. You know, you I could mean, buy a book, but you could just watch YouTube videos. You could just watch too. it for, for like 24 hours and at least, you know, play something. Yeah. Do you have a prediction for like the future of what the next media category is? Like the big next big media category. Like we have, we have podcasts and video and movies. Do you think there's going to be like a whole... Hmm. whole new way that we experience things well this is uh, i'm not gonna blow anyone's mind by saying this but like i think my prediction or this is more my hope Hmm. is like i think vr is amazing but kind of stupid and like plays (laughs) to the worst of humanity but i do think ar is fascinating Mm -hmm. you know and i do feel like um i hope podcasting discovers ar Hmm. um because it's such a natural marriage. Um, what does like, that look like? Like listening to a podcast while you have an augmented experience? In yeah, front of you? I mean, it's, or uh, so much. There's so many ways in which, like we say, stories are these vehicles for empathy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many ways in which all that you want in a story is to 
force someone to walk in, in someone else's shoes, right? And it's amazing to think that you can create not just stories and narratives, but actually environments and spaces that people can walk in. Or you could, you know, tell a story about history. Like, I don't know, have you ever, have you ever watched Walk Down uh, Wall Street in Manhattan? And all of these, like, like tie-wearing bros are walking around. But you're thinking, man, like, Alexander Hamilton walked down the street. And then you take a right on whatever street it is, and there's, like, big... There's a corner off of Wall Street where there's like a big chunk that's been taken out of the, uh, out of the concrete. And uh, if you just do a little search, you realize that in 1920-something, there was a bomb it, bombing by anarchists. And they just like blew up the building. And there's a big chunk missing from the building. But mm. no one knows. Mm. Like it would be interesting to tell stories about these places and to see those ghosts of the past walk with us. Mm. You know, and to see the people who did those things, who walked these streets. Uh, suddenly appear before us, mm. but not appear in a VR sense where you're removed from your reality, but they appear and stand next to you yeah. in your world, yeah. right? Yeah, That's super interesting to me. Yeah. I've always thought that that's probably where VR air is going to go because like forcing someone to put a headset on, like every level of friction that you have mm. when getting into an environment, the less likely someone is to use that that method or environment. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel long before Warby Parker just has AR implants in all their glasses. Yeah. You know, that just feels like three, ten, five years away. Yeah, yeah. So my big prediction would be that storytelling will find its way into that universe very quickly. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, like, just like workaday storytellers mm -hmm. will start to, I mean, the big companies are already doing big exhibits and yeah. experiments. But like you exactly. and I will be doing stories for that. For, for that. Yeah. Um, I hope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you said, um, like, when you're just walking down the street and you see a chunk and you look it up, is that, like, how you find stories? Like, how do you usually go about finding the best stories? What is your method for that? Yeah, you read a lot and you, I mean, my best method probably is um, I get overwhelmed with, like, reading stuff online mm -hmm. and I lose my bearings as to what's interesting. But uh, I have a lot of people that I, over the years, I just, like, I have breakfast with them, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, people that you really like the way they think and, mm. and you're just interested to know what they're reading. So I would have this habit of just like every week having two or three breakfasts with various people I know and um, just kind of ask them what, what they're paying attention to. Um, and most of my ideas start with those breakfasts, mm. you know, of like, oh, that so-and-so has just read a galley of X and Y book and thinks this is interesting. And let me call them and call that person and then just follow the leads a little bit and see where that goes. Um, that's kind of what I, that's kind of the path I take. Mm. Um, someone like Latif who I, who works with me uh, at Radio Lab and who sort of is the successor host, one of the two successor hosts, he's, he, he will just like, he gets so many of his ideas, like they begin his tiny Twitter threads and then he'll follow them. So he uses social media in, mm. a, in that way. But I find I just get spun around by all that stuff. Mm. And Mm -hmm. I just I need to talk to somebody. Yeah. So just day. having conversations with people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you have any burning questions? Yeah. So one last question. How fast can you type the alphabet? <laughs> <laughs> Should we do this? Wait, is that a thing? That okay, yeah. Do? So so on on Waveform we generally have this uh we have this like race that people have to do <laughs> whenever we have them on. I'm a pretty fast typer, but I've never typed the alphabet. It's harder than you think. I would imagine. We have a we have like a um, leaderboard, and I'm like l second to last or something. So okay, <laughs> all right. I could just start at any point. Yes, all whenever right. you're ready. All right, here I go. Where do I? Where did I get to? Point three four two. Six point three four two. Okay, that's really good. Is that good? Yeah, They're good. That's pretty good. I'm gonna look up the this overall score now. But I feel like I could have done better, and I made him. You get three tries. You get three, three tries. tries. All right, I'm gonna do it, Ben. And we don't, we won't count the first one because you just hit A. No, but. we'll <laughs> count it if it's my best. Okay, six point <laughs> six point three four two. Yeah. All right, here we go. Reset. All right. Six point three two one. Okay. okay. Better. Slightly better. Where do I rank? Where does he rank? I'm looking it up. Wait, where is it? You have one more run, so I'm gonna get six point three two one is the I'll, current one. I'm gonna break. I'm gonna break the four four second. Barrier. Oh shoot! Okay, 
I'm just going to throw caution to the wind. Five point one seven six. Ooh. Five point one seven six. You are right after Josh Wardle, the guy who created oh, the guy Wordle. who made Wordle. And oh my God! You beat me by point one seconds. So you are number four. Wow! Oh shoot! Really? Wait, what's the top time? Top time is Quinn of Snazzy Labs. He's a YouTuber. He got four point four three two. All right. All right. Interesting cool. way to end an interview. Thank yeah. You. Well, thank you. Oh, man. And it was like a lot of a, a lot of ping ponging, but uh, no, it was great. It was really yeah. great. Um, uh, it was really cool. All right. Thank you, David and Jad, for the time. We also need to do our trivia answers now. We've yeah. had some time to stew on it. For those of you driving, you did not Google the answers, and for those of us hosting, we also did not Google the answers. We didn't. So remind us the first question, Adam. I do. Not think I know the first one. But. So the first question, Carl Pei, the CEO of Nothing and right. co-founder of OnePlus, grew up in which European country? Okay. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I feel like I should know this, but I don't. So I'm going to guess Sweden. Oh, I was going to go with the UK, which is that a country? Because I'm an idiot. United Kingdom. Britain. It's Sweden. No, oh, it is. Oh. I knew it. Okay, it's like this like small like thing in the back of my head was like, I've known this. I don't know I if it's there, real, but I do know this. Right now, nothing's based in the UK, and they- Nothing is, yeah. Nothing is, sorry. Yeah, something, yeah. but nothing. I'm confused already. The nothing thing? I hate this name so much. Yeah, nothing. Uh, okay. The other one, though, I have to do some mental math, because it's been a minute. So the next question, the headphones that you're wearing right now are the Audio-Technica ATH M50Xs. What year were they released in? Now, you specified M50X, so there was the M50 and M50S, but M50X came out a little bit later. So I reviewed the M50s, and I compared them to a bunch of other headphones. Are these different than the red colorware ones that were here? Red were colorware? Just, remember we had... We had a red M50X. They were just red? They made red ones. That was an M50X? That was an X, Okay, yeah. so... I started in 2017, and that was the first pair of headphones I used when I started. So they were here in 2017. Mm -hmm. So it's before that. That's about as much information as I can give towards this question. Going 20, 2014. I was going to say 15. 2014. Nice. Two for two. Good job. Not only are you two for two, you got to watch me say the UK is a country. So I hope Adam edits that part out. Please don't make me look like an idiot. That was impressive. I, I did the Good math job. on like, I, I did the comparison with the M50X versus the Beats Pro in college, which was 2014 and 2015 when I was in that apartment. So it was one of those two years. Yeah. So, yeah. I Damn. feel pretty good about that. Good job. All right. Are we keeping, are we tallying who, how many we get oh, right? Oh, no. <laughs> if I knew go. that, I would have tried harder. Let's go. All <laughs> right. Well, that's a good place to end it. Thanks for sticking up with us this week. Uh, we'll be back next week with more Waveform. Yeah. Catch you guys later. Peace. Waveform is produced by Adam Molina. We are a partner with Vox Media, and our intro outro music was created by Vane Silk. Mm -hmm.